Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Marketing for the Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Braden Cruz. And on today's episode with Say Less and Sell More with a special guest, David Saltzman with the Saltzman Group. He's a fractional CMO offering a set of benefits. He's been in the business for quite some time. We're going to learn a lot of quality information with the marketing and advertising space. So David Saltzman, how are you today, sir? I'm well, Braden. How are you? I'm fantastic. It's a really good Friday. It's a little chilly out here in Tulsa, but hopefully uh, we hit that spring weather sometime next week. So. Hey, it's a little chilly here in Knoxville, and tomorrow morning it's supposed to be 27 degrees. So we, we went from being 60 degrees today to having a freeze warning tomorrow morning. Yep. Yeah, Tulsa's right right about there with you. Yeah. So, uh, man, we've got a lot of really good content to cover today, and really I want to talk about some big high-level strategy and messaging um, that's targeted and I think a lot of people throw money down a rabbit hole and they don't know where they're wasting that money. That goes back to that saying where you waste 50% of your, your marketing dollars, but you don't know where that 50% you're wasting. And that can be reflected uh, all the way back to the very beginning with strategy and messaging. So you can reduce that 50% down to 10 <laughs> if you have the right strategy and messaging and the right team behind you to, to support all that. So um, tell me a little bit about your history and how you got started? Well, I've, I've been a, an author and columnist for almost 35 years. Um, had a great career in the insurance industry. Have done an awful lot of different things. And when the Dead Tree magazine stopped publishing, I started writing content for some online e-zines and stuff. And uh, about 13 years ago, I decided that I wanted to make a change. And the thing that really lit me up is helping people clarify and tell their stories and tell their message. Um, because, you know, as Tom Lehrer, the satirist, once said, the least those of you who can't communicate can do is shut up. And there are a lot of people who can't communicate. And that goes to exactly the problem that you were talking about, about all of a sudden watching your marketing dollars evaporate and there's nothing left behind except a puff of blue smoke. Um, and so I've been doing that for a long time. And about five years ago, uh, read a book that changed kind of my approach to marketing. It's called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. I'm sure some of your viewers have, um, and listeners have, have read it. And um, I decided, well, I'm the marketing guy. You know, I, I can do this for myself. And after my third attempt, I called Nashville and Don's office. And I said, hey, can I come study with you guys? Because clearly there's more to this than meets the eye. And have taken that approach with our clients. I believe that we're the only... Um, chief marketing officer organization, I'm aware, or marketing organization for that matter, where I insist that we start with message because marketing is downstream from message. And folks who don't do that end up having exactly the problem that you outlined, Braden. And so this is where you would say, this is where marketing starts. Step one is messaging. And this is also where a CMO would start. A chief marketing officer would start by what is our messaging and being able to tell that story accurately, right? right? You know, human beings are only designed to do two things. They're designed to thrive and survive. If we overload them with information and they can't clearly understand what it is we're trying to communicate, whether it's selling or anything else, they start hearing Charlie Brown's teacher. They just kind of tune out. Um, websites are a great example uh, that I frequently use. How many times have you looked at a website and you've thought to yourself, wow, that's a really great website. I wonder what the hell they do. And that's death. But so that's, many times. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And it's because somebody had this great idea that, hey, let's go build a website and let's do some social media and let's do this and do that. Insert buzzword here. But the message that they're putting out is completely and totally unclear. And if you listen to the research that Forrester gives us, and we'll stay on the web for a minute, although it's true of pretty much all forms of communication, we now have 13 seconds of eyeball time with somebody who's found our site or looking at our stuff to grab them as a client. And if they can't understand what you do in 13 seconds, they're gone. They're off to the next website. Yeah, I just made a made a short TikTok about engagement rate and bounce rate. So we're not going to get too nitty gritty just yet. But like, just like what you said, like that's so important. A lot of a lot of uh, businesses that we approach and we start working with, their bounce rates are so high or their mm -hmm. engagement rates are so low just from what Google Analytics is telling us. And a lot of times that even goes 
through social media. There's so many social media profiles where we look at and they're posting all sorts of stuff. Some of them can be great and some of them can be terrible. So some of them can be consistent. Some of them just haven't posted in the last eight months. Are you still in business? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I see like to where, you know, some of that messaging is totally inconsistent and you're like, I, I look, I'm like, what do you guys do? What, what, what are you here to solve? Like who, who's your customer? And it's, it's hard to determine that all the way down from when something's being posted or what's being put on the web, right? Yeah. Hit or miss is not a marketing strategy. You know, throwing spaghetti against the wall, hoping some of it will stick. Not a marketing strategy. Volume of message, not a marketing strategy. So if your message isn't clear, you're toast. If you confuse, you lose. That's, that, that's something, you know, if you want to take away one thing from, from this conversation, if you're working on your marketing stuff and you confuse people, you're toast. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter what venue you're in, whether it's social media, print, billboards, dropping leaflets from the sky. It doesn't matter because folks need to understand that you understand their problem and that you can solve it. In, in story brand parlance, we call that being the guide. And too often people omit the entire first part of the conversation that you have to have with yourself when you're building a marketing campaign. And they just figure, well, I've got solutions and I've got a big white horse. And so I'll just ride on into the client and I'll drop my marketing solutions on them. And huzzah, they will be amazed and they will be clients forever. And friends, it don't work that way uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that the people who run businesses, they're the hero of their story. You can't be the hero of their story. So we, we always tell clients, think Yoda, not Luke Skywalker. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, this, does every industry have a hero and a problem, right? So whether you're a retail pizza shop restaurant or SaaS company, does every industry and every company have a hero and a, pro and a, and a problem to solve? Yeah, they, they have a hero, or I, I prefer to call it, I know some people call it hero, and they use the, the nomenclature of a hero's journey. I prefer to call it a main character, because sometimes they're heroic and sometimes they're not. But the bottom line is that they have a problem. If, if, if we take you through the seven-part story brand framework in really short order, it's a main character has a problem. That character expresses that problem, and this is really important, externally, internally, and philosophically. That main character meets a guide and the guide shows empathy and authority he says, hey, I understand your problem. We've solved loads of problems like this before. We can help you. Kind of like, you know, don't go down that road because there's potholes and trees down. Go this way. It's paved. It's better. And then the guide gives them a simple plan. The plan is one, two, three, four. If you must five, but that's it. And then the guide shows them what life will look like, what success will look like if they follow that plan after a couple of calls to action and what it looks like if they don't. And the reason that we use the what happens if they don't is because fear of loss is a much greater human motivator than desire for gain. So we paint both pictures. That's fascinating. Where And I'm going to kind of take a step back to the CMO uh, sure. beginning part is who, what, what is a CMO? What do they do? A chief marketing officer is someone who's responsible for the message and the strategy and the implementation of the marketing efforts for a particular company. And for those who are wondering, it's not that person that's updating the website and it's not that person making a post on social media. Those are separate roles. Correct. Correct. That's okay. why I said it's the person who's responsible for that. Now, truth be told, in some organizations, it's one person doing all that stuff. You've had clients like that. So have I. In other cases, there's a whole bunch of people. In some cases, it's outsourced. But at the end of the day, the CMO is the tip of the spear. The CMO is the person who works with the organization to understand what their imperatives are, what their needs are, and to help translate that into marketing that that solves those problems and brings in the solutions to those needs. And you don't have to have this role full time in order for it to provide value. Well, no. And in point of fact, you know, if you know that, as most of us do, that most of America's businesses are small businesses, um, a full time chief marketing officer for a, a decent sized company can run upwards of two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year plus benefits. Good ones are worth every penny. Bad ones aren't worth any penny. But that's the range. But if you go to 
a, a relatively mid-sized business, say they're 50 or 60 or 75 or 100 employees, even sometimes 200, all of their executives are wearing three or four hats and they don't have that kind of budget, but they still have that kind of need. Arguably, they have more of the need because they're all fractured so much. So what we as fractional CMOs do is we go in and we say, okay, you can't afford a full-time chief marketing officer. You still need that kind of help. So you can buy us on a part-time basis, whether it's a project basis or whether it's you buy so many hours a month or some combination of the two, or whether you just do an annualized agreement where you're not a full-time employee and they don't have all that cost and overhead, but they still get that input that they need. Which is highly valuable for sure. And I know that it saves the people, it saves companies a ton of money from having to afford that full-time position and in insurance and taxes and, you know, another butt in the seat costs more money. So if you don't yeah, have sometimes to have they just house, can't. I mean, it, it, it's yeah. not a question of they don't want it. It's just a question of they just don't have the budget for it. And I heard that, uh, I believe it was a conversation that you and I had a couple of weeks ago was that the average CMO in a company only lasts two years. And, and knowing that if that's correct, that's expensive to replace that person, especially if they're sal a six figure salary, you're not paying someone 45,000 a year to be a CMO. Right. No, right. And, and, you know, and, and it's because of exactly what you talked about at the open. It, it's because folks get this notion that, okay, cool, we're going to do some marketing. And they hire somebody and they bring them in and they start throwing spaghetti against the wall. And at the end of the first year, they do a recap and they go, gee, this didn't work out the way we thought it was going to be. And the CMO says, yeah, but it's really only six months worth of results because the first six months I was kind of getting your input, learning your business, understanding what you need. And then they get to another 12 months and the same things happen and everybody just gets frustrated and they say, well, this isn't working. And in large measure, that's because they never worked on the message. At what point uh, would you recommend a company needing a CMO? Like we, we just understood that you can't hire a CMO for 45,000 a year, right? These are on, these are commonly six figure full-time roles or fractionally uh, there's uh, adjustable rates in that too, depending on who, who you hire for your fractional CMO. But at what point do you think a company should consider hiring for that role internally or externally? I think when they've plateaued is, is a time that a lot of companies look at that and go, okay, what do we need to move to the next level? If their messaging isn't getting traction, if they're sitting there saying to themselves, gee, you know, we, we've got a better mousetrap, but nobody's buying it. Don't understand what the problem is. Um, and so they're, they're talking about the mechanics of how the mousetrap works and they're not talking about, hey, you got mice in your house? Boy, that's a nuisance. We can help you. Um, it, it varies from, from client to client. But typically, when they get to that third psychological level, that internal level that we talked about, mm -hmm. and their brain is going, it just shouldn't be so darn hard to do X. You need to bring somebody else in to kind of take a look at the messaging and help you. And I think of equal import is to help your team. Because once you hone the message down, you want the team to be bringing the same message to the street. That way you look like a cohesive, bigger organization. And you're a, you're a fractional CMO yourself. Right. Yes. So who do you need in position prior to you stepping in? In the company? Who, yes. So if you're like, well, I mean, we're not talking C-level, like we're talking anybody around you that would support you in, in what you're helping the company strive It depends for. on the client. Every client, that's a great question. Every client is different. Some clients have folks internally who do that kind of work. And for some of our clients, we do that kind of work. Now, I don't do it. I don't do most of it myself anymore. I have a team of folks that I work with who can provide all those kinds of things. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to work with somebody on the wording for a wireframe for a website, but I don't build websites anymore. Um, but I've got folks who do and who are brilliant at it. So every client is different. I mean, my motto kind of unofficially is when you've seen one client, you've seen one client. Doesn't mean that they're all copy and paste in the exact same structure or the exact same needs either. No, actually, it means that that each one is unique and you've got to take them on as unique, even if, you know, you're saying in the back of your head, you know, I've seen this problem before. I know what's going to happen here. They're still unique. They have unique desires and unique wants and unique goals and unique ways of getting there and budgets and all those kinds of variables. That doesn't really change whether you're coming in as an FTE or whether you're coming in as a fractional. 
Do you think it matters what kind of CMO has in their experience and what trade they like to pertain to? So, for example, could a CMO from a SaaS company come over to CMO as uh, an engineering company? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the problem is the problem. And the solution is the solution. If And I've worked with all kinds of companies. I, I worked with a client out in Austria last year who was a former Tony Robbins trainer who was starting his own coaching business mm-hmm. and needed help doing that kind of stuff. I work with people who are doing small business cloud computing solutions. Um, obviously, I work with some folks in the insurance industry. Uh, it doesn't really matter so much. I mean, we, we work in high tech. We work in medicine. Because when you scale it all back, and the reason that Don still sells 100,000 books a year is that the problems really aren't that different and the approach to them isn't that different. You have a main character. I'm going to be redundant here, but for purposes of this question, we have a main character who's got a problem and needs the problem solved and is stuck. That doesn't matter what industry it is, whether they need to produce more rubber baby buggy bumpers or they need to, you know, bring more eyeballs to their product or whatever. Well, that's what I've argued too. So I, I, per, I professionally don't like to pertain to just one industry. Uh, I, I can agree with you on that too. Like the problem's a problem, and there's a solution to that same to that problem. No matter what the industry is, it's okay. You know, what are your unique challenges? Uh, what's uh, it, your 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 particular you know things like budget or people or services can vary. But again, the problem is going to stay the same. There's a solution that I can help you figure out to the problem. And basically, how can I acquire people's eyeballs? How can I get their attention? Right. right. How do I create that messaging? What what content needs to be created or things like that after the messaging is created and that strategy is put together in order to acquire people's attention to bring them to that business? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And if there is industry specific information that a fractional CMO or a CMO who's full time needs to know, it's on them to learn about it. You know, you you get your cues from the client, but the answer is, okay. well, what are the challenges in this industry? What's going on? Who, Who are the competitors? What's the noise like? How do you cut through? What do you need to differentiate? It's the same kind of, you know, I I call it a PSSR kind of mindset. What's the problem? What's the scope of the problem? What's the solution? And what's the result? And I'm glad that you that you said just a moment ago that it takes about six months to work with a client or to work with a business or work in a space to be able to understand their unique challenges, their unique demographic. And I'll explain to to multiple businesses. I'm like, just because this particular method worked for them does not mean it's going to work for you. Right. Just because whatever avenue advertising or messaging, et cetera, that they've done doesn't mean I can sit here, copy and paste that. Now your demographic is going to love that and they're going to engage or convert the exact same way. Well, no, in point of fact, that's one of the problems that we deal with so often is that within an industry, somebody wants to do what their competitors are doing. And my answer is always you don't ever want to be doing what your competitors are doing. You want to do what they're not doing. Correct. But should be. Thank you for finishing my sentence. It we sound like an old be. married couple now, but yeah. Uh, I absolutely. love it. But it, but it <laughs> Let's it, get it, passionate it, together about it. <laughs> it. You know what? It, it, it's truth, right? If, if you want to cut through the noise, you can't do what everybody else is doing because then you're the noise. Mm-hmm. If you don't yeah. want to be the noise, be different. Yep. It, uh, have you heard of Mike Michalowicz? Mm-hmm. Sure. I've actually had the pleasure a couple of weeks ago about of seeing uh, Mike speak down in, uh, in Coral Gables at a meeting I was at. Oh, how was that? I'd love to go. It was awesome. And he's a great speaker. That's awesome. I'm reading his, uh, one of his audio books. That's actually be different, which mm-hmm. is what you just said, uh, about 16% through that book. And I've downloaded the resources and I'm working on that as well. And I'm always, I'm always eager to learn and, and to learn new things and try new practices and things like that as well. And also to learn from others such as yourself. Right. Well, I, I think you find that in, in people who are in the marketing business, you have to, because if you don't stay current and you get stale, you're just like a cookie, you crumble. Yeah, exactly. How do I, okay. So now that we're talking about being different and, and this, this is probably going to be a a pretty good segment here. How, how, uh, how do I differentiate my brand and messaging? Is there, is there a framework? Is there any particular ideas? Is there a structure to this or is it like honestly just unique and we have to come up with a scenario to talk about? Well, I, I think the answer to your question is both. Each, each company is unique and each industry is unique in its own way. But the problem that I find most often is the infection that needs to be cured is that folks 
talk about how their watch is made and don't just answer the question, what time is it? Clients don't care about all the backroom stuff that you care about. Clients don't care about um, how all the pieces go together. I'll, I'll give you a, a quick kind of funny story. Uh, a friend of mine, got to be a friend because you can't do this to somebody who's not a friend. But a friend of mine a couple of years ago called me and said, hey, you know, I think I need some help with my marketing. Can you help me? And I said, well, sure. But it was in the fall. And I said, I really don't have availability until after the first of the year. I was finishing up a couple of large projects, one of which was that fellow in Austria that I mentioned. And he said, well, OK, that's great. We, we can work together after the first of the year, but we got a half an hour scheduled for the call. If you were going to start, where would you start? Oh, OK, want to play this game? We'll do that. I said, your website. And he said, well, what's wrong with our website? And I said, it sucks. You just called this baby ugly. Yep. <laughs> and uh, at least you're he, honest. But, I mean, well, but, it, but it's worse. It's worse because he said he said, well, OK, um, that surprises me. Um, can you tell me what part of the website is terrible? I said, no, I can't do that. And he said, why not? I said, because I've never seen your website, but I can tell you it sucks. He said, how can you tell me it sucks if you've never seen it? And so I started by telling him what was on, without seeing it, what was on the homepage of his website. You know, we've got, we've got great team and great products and we've won all these awards and we do this and we do that. And he said, well, we're really proud of that. I said, cool, put it in a corporate brochure, snail mail it to the client a week before the, your appointment and say, I want to focus on you during our appointment, but I thought you might want to learn a little bit about us. He said, you have every right to be proud of all of that stuff. But there isn't a prospect on earth who gives a wit about any of it. They want to know that you understand their problem and that you can solve it. That's all. So there are commonalities even within the differentiation, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So this kind of falls up to the next kind of segment is that secret sauce, right? Uh, how do you how do you figure out what that secret sauce is? Um, like, I think we've been talking about analysis, competitor analysis, right? Being able to figure out like what they're doing, what they're not doing, how can we differentiate and how can we acquire the attention of, of the, of the audience, right? Um, that, what do you have, what do you have more on like the secret sauce stuff? Because that's what everyone wants to know. They're like, there's some magic to this because they've seen these companies scale and scale and grow quick. Right. So we go all the way back to the messaging and we talk about the external and uh, which is like, what do you tell others? And then the internal part of like, what do you tell yourself? And you and I had some great conversations on that a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's the reason that's important. And I'll go back to, um, to the psychological depths of all of this, because it underpins the answer to your question. We don't make decisions with the prefrontal cortex, which is our, the reasoning part of our brain. There's a great industrial psychologist named Daniel Kahneman who wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. I do not recommend the book to anybody who is not a fourth year psych student because it's really <laughs> dense. But Kahneman's thesis that he proved over the course of his lifetime of work is that we make decisions, buying decisions, who we love, what house we buy, what car we get, what to buy for dinner, et cetera. We make those decisions with the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. It's where that emotional part of our brain still lives. We've just gotten as human beings amazingly adept over thousands of years at instantly rationalizing those decisions. So we think we're making rational decisions, but in point of fact, we're making emotional decisions. So the first step to connecting with the prospect that you want to connect with is understanding what their problem is on a psychological level so that you can push that little button. It sounds, you know, kind of cut and dried and medicinal, but that's how people think. That's how you get to them. If you think about the commercials that you remember, I mean, the, the one that I always use because everybody remembers it is, and it only runs at Christmas time, is the one with the polar bears and the Coca-Cola. And it's always an aww, kind of warm and fuzzy moment. But right. that's the message of the holidays. It's being around family. It's all, all those kinds of things. And that's why that commercial resonates. Sometimes it can be fear, like that commercial that Apple only ran once with a guy throwing a hammer through the screen in the, in the theater. But people still talk about it. Why? Because it triggered an emotion. So that's, that's the first step. You, you need to understand that emotional piece. Market research is great. It's terrific to understand what everybody else is doing, but every successful business ultimately is based on relationships and relationships are created by guides who have empathy and authority. 
And so that's how you want to position yourself in your given market. I agree on everything that you just said. I've, I've, been, I've told a lot of people that it, I don't believe it's ever just business. I believe you have to, and if people are making emotional decisions, then you have to build a relationship. You have to build some level of trust. They have to be able to make some level of emotional decision, right? So it's never just business and it, it, there's a lot of trust that has to be built up in that as well too. So even if, even if in the messaging and what an, an ad portrays or video or copy or, or an article or something like that, there's got to be something that evokes an emotion. This is, this is actually pretty relevant. There's a client called Soldier's Wish that we work with and then they grant wishes to nonprofit veteran or to veterans. They're a nonprofit agency. Um, there was one agent, one, one veteran that he was, he's 87 years old and he hasn't had heat in his own for the last two years. Wow. Imagine what his summers are like as well. So they found out about this and immediately they pulled together a couple of businesses to help donate some money and labor to be able to install a brand new HVAC system. We were there to capture that whole giving moment between Soldier's Wish and that veteran. And when we're making the content from it and telling people about it, I'm like, listen, I, I don't care about all the other cute stuff. I need that. That's the focus. That's going to give me the emotional impact to where I go, wow, I have to be involved in Soldier's Wish. I need to be a donor. I need to be a sponsor. I have to be a part of this. And I actually was just talking with the client about this as well. For the last six months, a lot of the social media content that they've been having us make has been happy birthday to the Navy, hug a veteran. Here's, here's a parade that we're a part of. Like, and, and I keep telling them, and this is something that we just talked about. And I was like, we need to be telling more stories. I need to be, we need to be posting content and creating videos that allows these veterans themselves to talk. I don't want you, I don't want soldiers to wish to say, here's everything that we can do. Look at us, right? It's not about you again. Okay. This, when we're talking about that, this industry has a hero, right? And these are heroes. So we, we need to interview some of them. We need to make sure you've got some photos and tell their stories and in a form of content that allows people to make that emotional connection and that tie. And I don't know about, about you, but, um, my sister is 16 and she's in the military now. So she's actually going through some training stuff and, and as she's finishing up high school and then my grandfather was in the Vietnam war. So I've got some emotional connection to why I want to be involved in soldier's wish, whether that's donation, whether that's labor, whether that's however. Right. And so over the last six months, like I said, we just are now being able to have this conversation to where I'm like, you have 30 to 40 veteran stories that you've granted wishes to. We need to repurpose this content and to, and to, and to tell those stories at scale. And it's well, and less about soldier's about. wish. You know, Lou Holtz said it. People, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's, that's the secret. That's, that's, that's been the hallmark of advertising. Call it marketing, call it whatever you want, business development. That's the hallmark of it. It starts with a relationship. It starts with a handshake. It starts with eye contact. But each client has a journey that they need you to help them go on. So with one of our questions was, how do you capture the attention of your audience? Is that a pretty good example? You, yeah, you, 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 yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, since you since you raised the issue of your grandfather, and I'm probably about the same vintage, um, we've done some work recently with an agency that helps people figure out the craziness that is Medicare, because you know it, the, the old saying that a, a camel is a horse that was designed by a committee. Medicare was designed by multiple committees, and so it's definitely not the horse they thought it was. And if you start talking about, okay, well, I'm going to market to senior citizens. Um, you haven't been there, but maybe you were there, you know, when you're, when your parents or somebody, you know, you turn 65 and you can get a hernia from dragging all the mail that you get from your mailbox back to the house. And it's all very pretty and it's all got loads of messaging on it. And it's totally confusing. We started going down the story brand path and talking about the Medicare beneficiary as the main character in this story. And when we got to the very end, what was clear was that what those folks are afraid of is making a mistake. It's mm -hmm. confusing. I don't want to make a mistake. I need somebody that I can trust 
to help me figure out what the best plan is for me. And then I need them to be there next year to do a review in case things have changed. So we, in one case, in one agency, the headline on their website is getting Medicare right. And that's, that's what they want to do. It, if you can communicate that with as few words as possible, hence the say less, sell more, you've got a winner. If you have to start explaining stuff, people's eyes glaze. I call those Mego conversations. It stands for my eyes <laughs> glaze over. You know, I'm, I'm working with a client now who, um, who sends out a whole video with spreadsheets and all kinds of stuff. And I'm picturing the people that he's sending it to saying, yeah, I'm grateful this fellow is thorough, but good Lord, just tell me the answer. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's how you, how you capture their attention is you have to understand what their need is. If you don't understand that, you can't mm -hmm. capture their attention because you're not telling their story. You're telling somebody else's. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do I, do you, do you have any tips on how to, uh, where, where do I get started on building that messaging or that story? Like there's, there's one example that I was thinking about was this insurance company that we're working with is, uh, is in the health insurance space. And their tagline is we make insurance suck less because everyone, nobody understands health insurance unless you're actually working in the space or you're in HR, nobody really understands all those little fine details, right? So it, it sucks. <laughs> and so they've got a little turn on their tagline where it's like, we make insurance suck less. And again, it kind of approaches the pain point, tells you exactly what they do and how they do it. Yeah, but I'm the client. I don't want it to suck at all. I want you to take all the suck away. So is there is there something that you would change in that? Yeah, I, first of all, I try, we try not to go negative. Um, we, we try to do, we try to say, okay, here's what you get, um, making, making it suck less. I mean, it, it, all right, if it sucks hundred percent without you, does it suck 70% with you? 60, 10, 42. I mean, I, I, I think it's cute, but I don't think that it says we know how to solve your problem. So, you know, Fair if enough. you wanted to yeah. stay in the suck vein, you know, <laughs> insurance sucks. Take away the suck. So I'm going to go back to, I need, um, I still need help with this. I need help with the CMO. I, I need someone in, in this place in that position that can, I can help me out. What happens if I never hire that role? And I just keep hiring the people that execute, execute social, execute video, execute ads. And I spend all this money in those avenues. You'll be poorer. It's not any more complicated than that. People spend and waste so much money on advertising and marketing and whatnot. And they might as well, you know, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, drop it in the toilet and watch it go clockwise around the, around the wheel before it goes down the drain. You have to start with message. You have to have to start with message. If you don't start with message, you can't get to step two. And, you know, I, I have had folks call and say, well, we've got this and we've got that and blah, blah. Well, OK, if you're in great shape, why are you calling me, first of all? But but second of all, show me your stuff. I mean, we start every client engagement starts with with an audit of what they're doing, what they've got and how it's working. And it's never yeah, this is working great for me. I mean, we're doing more and more of it. And the more we do, the better we're solving our problem. It's always I don't know what we're doing wrong, but it's not working. Do you ever have a client that doesn't know what is and what isn't working? Oh, sure. Sure. Is that, is that common? It is, especially when they haven't really engaged. When, when those clients I mentioned earlier, when, they, when their sales are good and then they plateau and they don't understand why. They don't know why that's happened. Um, that's frequently a, a place where they don't really understand what the issue is, but they know something's happened because it was good and now it's not. Sometimes it's just they find themselves with a new competitor in town who's eating their lunch. And True. what they've done all along just won't work. What got you here won't get you there. Do you feel like do you feel like a good CMO is also good in business? Yeah, I think you have to be. I, I think you have to have some business savvy. Um, like I, like there's other roles in organizations to where I don't feel like you have to be as business savvy. But in mark in a marketing role, I feel like you have to be pretty business savvy. You uh, uh, like. Of course, like accounting, right? Somewhat business savvy, but it's it's numbers. They're cut and dry. They're ones and zeros. 
like there's not a whole lot of worry about relationships, but things like that, like messaging, there's no messaging in accounting, right? In HR, it's a little eternal. It's, it's more etern- internal mm-hmm. and there's just, there's just not as much that goes into some of these other departments as I feel like that does sales and marketing. It's like the field of the fire, right? It's the field of the engine without, without marketing and sales, you have no business, right? You could still run dry on some of these other departments, but I feel like majority of the business and the, the CEOs, the presidents, the executives, the owners, they have to be heavily involved in the marketing and the sales process and people. I would agree to that. And I, I think the best CMOs need to be able to, at some points, be on the ground and at other points, be at drone level. You have to be able to see the organization. You have to be able to go up and down. Right. right? Because there's stuff that's granular and there's stuff that's strategic. So the best chief marketing officers are almost always equal parts tactical and strategic. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I can agree on that. That's unusual. Most people can't do that. Most people have like one side of the brain or the other. Okay. And they'll go, oh my God, I'm glad you said that. I feel, okay. So once you, once you find that person, you found a unicorn. And that is why that person is worth, just like you said, that, that six figure salary. Right. And if they're not, then they're not worth a penny. Right. So if you want to find somebody that's analytical, strategic, creative, and personable, I, I feel like some of those characteristics, if, if, let me know if there's any others, but that's almost unicorn because you're two different sides of the brain. And usually people are one or the other. Right. That, that's why there, you know, there are loads of people who go into marketing and there's a handful of people who go into marketing successfully. And I think if you're if you're working with a business, you have an obligation to understand at a 10,000 foot level, their commerce, their place in, in the industry flow, you know, what they're trying to accomplish, what they're up against, et cetera. Thankfully, we have Google and LinkedIn and all those online tools. And, you know, we it, it's not a, it's not as heavy a lift as it used to be to kind of understand where a client who's coming to you is positioned in the marketplace. But you have to do that. And I, it's interesting as my practice goes along. I find the the long term relationships aren't really with my helping them to create anything. It's more strategic. So we've got I've got a number of clients where we have a weekly strategy call, and we just bounce kind of ideas around and whatnot because you know this. It's hard to read the label when you're inside the mayonnaise jar, right? It's like the the plumber whose sink is clogged up, or the or the shoemaker whose kids don't have holes in their shoes or don't have shoes. Which is why it, somebody would ask, why do I need a coach? Right. Why do I need to hire a consultant? Right. And it's like, you can't see what you're doing wrong. Like, it's almost kind of like trying to uh, proofread your own work. And me and my team were talking about that. This is like where you, you need that other person to proofread where you misspelled or where grammar needs to be updated. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and it, I don't want to go the whole, it takes a village route, but, but I mean, it, it does. <laughs> um, you need to have a multi, you need to have multiple vantage points, but you still need to have somebody who's leading the parade. You know, you, you, there's a reason they put the trombones in the front of the line. It's so they don't goose anybody else. Well, that's where the chief marketing officers are. They're in the they're in the front of the line, but then they also run around and get in the back of the line, and then they're the drum major. So they wear lots of different hats depending on what the situation is. Oftentimes, we'll work with the C-suite with a client, even in a mid-sized client, and then the question is, yeah, but my team's got to understand this. So we work with the teams. That's way more granular and, and, you know, shoe leather level than the highfalutin rarefied air in the C-suite. But they're both parts of the same thing. And you've got to be able to capture that across the organization. To your question, if you're not good at business, if you don't have a good business head on your shoulders, you can't do that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Wow, I've got so many questions. (laughs) <laughs> okay. So I, I want, I want to uh, uh, give me a story time. Um, has anything happened in the last 90 days to six months that is story worthy? Something to where you're like, this has crashed and burned or something that has been like, oh my God, touchdown. Yeah. And I, I think it, it, it's a great question and it's an interesting question. I, and I think um, it, it's not a parochial marketing answer, although it is, and I'll, I'll try to explain. Um, I was at a conference in Coral Gables, and it was of all it was an insurance related, and medical insurance, health insurance related group of people who 
espouse a deep hatred for the big organizations. We call them BUCAs in the business, Blue Cross, United, Humana. Well, Humana is dropping out now, but, you know, those guys. Um, and they want to build a better mousetrap. And as I was going to the sessions, and I, I was there because the, my podcast won an award. So they said, you should come down and get your tuxedo press. And I went, oh, okay. Um, four days in Coral Gables, your nickel. I'm there, man. Yeah, I'm I'll take eat, it. I'm, I'm going to eat my weight in Ropa Vieja and Cuban coffee. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. Um, and so I, I went to a lot of the sessions because they were really, really good. You know, sometimes meetings, you know, in a session that's good. Yeah. A session where you go, I should have just stayed by the pool. These were really good. And as I watched the sessions, there was this dichotomy that was happening. On one hand, they were saying, yeah, you know, patients, members, employees, if you will, of organizations really like having that one card with the one logo on it. And when they go to the doctor, they drop that card and that's the end of it. On the other hand, in the other sessions, they're all talking about how we're building this new thing and it's got all these parts and it's really much better and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to all kinds of depth. And I finally said to a couple of the conference organizers, I said, it seems to me that the challenge for your group is building an, an, an organization, building a, a Chinese wall, if you will, between the user and all this stuff you guys are building so that to them, this whole thing, while it may be better, looks frictionless. And it was kind of an epiphany in a way to say it reinforced and it also expanded my view of the fact that it's not about the machinery that clients make. It's about the problem that they solve and what it looks like on the user end, because it's, it's 2023. The entire universe is ruled by user experience. It doesn't matter what it is. If the user experience is terrible, folks aren't going to use it. I was told to work on the way that we provide what it looks like to drive the car. So like a test drive without actually driving anything. So like, show me what it's like to drive the car, right? Or to be in the car and, and relatable to what our services are for our clients. And it's, it's gotten me to be more, it's, it's forced me to be more creative and how that's portrayed in the sales process from initial conversation to close. Right. And, and why is that? It's because what your clients are saying to you or your prospects are saying to you is build a simulator. Right. Well, and, and, and then show me some visuals. I need to be able to see what the next steps are. Yeah. What, what is what is after I do this? OK, cool. What's next? OK, after I do this. OK, what's next? And so there's a whole process that I'm that I'm really working on trying to get granular while creating some visuals. And so before I actually execute any of this um, or propose it or client face it. I want to make sure that the back end structure is there to support it as well. Yes, but the back end structure has to be completely transparent to the client. But I'm smiling because what are they asking you to do? You have children. Mm -hmm. Tell me a story. About That's all they're asking. Oh, they're yeah, saying, they're asking you to tell a story. story. Right. And so, it, yeah, tell me the story. And, and without, and again, you're not the hero. Right. And I can conjure up in my mind what the dragon breathing fire and smoke looks like. <laughs> You know, I, I, I don't need that, but but I want to hear I want the story. I want to say, OK, I'm the hero in my story. I'm the main character and I've got these problems and I meet this sidekick who helps me and gives me a plan and says, hey, if I do things one, two, three and four, by gosh, my problem will be solved and I will be living in a great place. And if I don't work with you guys, guess what? I'm going to be back where I started digging the hole deeper. It's a story. Everything that communicates. We were making paintings on cave walls in Chauvert, France, 38,000 years ago. I, I mean, the, the, the joke is that years ago there were hieroglyphics, little symbols mm -hmm. that were, you know, banged into cave walls. And today we have emojis. Have we changed? No, we still want stories. Yeah, no, over the last six months, I've been working on um, improving this, how I tell stories. Yeah, whether Most that's powerful like, person man, in any on social media or, or portfolio stuff like on our website mm -hmm. or, or things like that. And, and some of that I need to go back through and continue to revise with my team and figure out some ways to, 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 to position our clients as the hero, as opposed to being like, look at what we did. No one cares like, what we did. Just like what you said. Nobody cares. Right. You wouldn't be in the room if they didn't think you could solve their problem. Right. So use that. It's almost like doing an assumed close, except you're, it's assumed I'm the guy. But it's, you know, Steve Jobs said the storyteller is the most important person in a company. Could that be its own role or is that a CMO? No, that, that, that's a CMO. 
There you go. Yeah, that's a CMO. And, yeah. you know, Tom Acker in, in his great book, which the title escapes me right now, um, said stories are order of magnitude more powerful than any set of facts. And yet we dwell on the fact. It's not about the facts. It's not that the story has to be can be false. It's got to be authentic. But we've got to tell the story. That's the same thing that, that your clients are asking you about when they're saying, build me a simulator. Show me what it's going to look like. Show me what working with you guys is all about. It's just tell me a story, daddy. Do you have any favorite stories? Yeah. Fox and Socks. Tell me about it. Fox and Socks is a Dr. Seuss book. I just I, I use it to warm up before I do um, any voiceover work or I do any meetings. It's just really? a bunch of tongue twisters. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. That makes I, sense. I actually, That's actually a good idea. I should I should actually download something like that or just implement the process before doing things like this as well. That'd yeah, nice. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you my favorite story, actually, if if I if I, you really pushed me is The Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. Because in there, there's a story about how this elephant, this baby elephant gets his no, long, long nose. And it's because he has insatiable curiosity. I think as you go through life, the best thing you can have is insatiable curiosity. Just, you know, why, why is that working that way? How does that work? How are those people doing this? Why is that happening? Ask those questions because that's, that's what good marketers do. They ask questions. I encourage all of my clients, every conversation that I've had, for the last six months, again, this last six months for me in my business has been has been um, pretty big game changers, and 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 process and, and conversations and, and telling those stories and such. But um, ah, shoot, I lost my train of thought. You had just said something. What was it? I'm not responsible for remembering those things I say. That's why oh we were. God, remember. yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah, we'll have a record, a re, a rewind. But it'll come back right? to you. It'll come back to you. Anyways, um, yeah, but being able to like tell those stories and those processes, man, that was such a good train that I was on. I'll come back around to it. Um, I love, I love telling stories, and and that's what I'm one of the big things I'm working on now. But so CMO is a really important position. And do you ever feel like the people don't value that position the way that they should? People, people, or executives or whoever would hire that position. Yeah, I, I think there, there's there's oftentimes a case where an in-house full-time employee CMO, they lose their sparkle over a little while or they they, they appear to everybody else to lose their sparkle because it, it, it's just the stuff. If, if you do your job well as a full-time CMO, it's one of these, of course, how else would you do it? And people stand, start to not take it for granted so much, but it just becomes table stakes. Um, and that, that happens sometimes, but you know, it, it, it's all relationships. It depends on how you set yourself up in the organization and what position you see yourself in. If you're just an implementer of somebody else's strategy, then, you know, yeah. But if, if you're, if, if for all of those little baby CMOs out there who are growing themselves into full-time jobs, make sure you're part of the team, make sure you're part of the leadership team, understand that you have an important role to fill on that team as important as HR or onboarding or hiring or, or any of those other disciplines or accounting. It's just as important as all the other roles. Absolutely. And especially as we mentioned, as I was talking about earlier, how it's the driver for the, for the engine, it's the gas for the engine. It's, it's without the proper sales and marketing people, you're still responsible, especially for a lot of these real small businesses. Right. And, and I believe that there's still, as far as I know, that there's still nobody, and I'm I'm still scouting, but there's nobody in this one client that I'm working with and their organization. I do believe that the owner still is heavily involved in the marketing and, and they don't have any, they don't really have like a salesperson because they're a restaurant, but I believe that he is the CMO position. And at some point, sooner or later, he's going to have to make that adjustment to where he re relies on somebody else and hands off that responsibility to be able to help drive the, these, these different engines. Cause he's got several brands. And so I just wonder how, how you're going to be able to, how somebody like that makes that transition, right? Like how do you find that right person to take over because he's so heavily involved and he does a great job. Right. But he need like, I, I, I don't have, as far as I know, there's no one else in that role. So how does he take over? How does he hand off that responsibility? Well, what it, does that transition look like? In my experience, finding the person to whom you hand it off is not nearly as challenging as getting somebody who's built something to hand it off. 
If you if you look at studies across and they teach us in pretty much every legitimate business school, companies will get to a certain size. Usually it's around 10, 12, 13 million dollars top line. And they have a decision to make. We want to be a kick ass 13 million dollar company. And that's awesome because you know how many companies don't make it at all, much less to 10 or 12 or 13 million. Or they have to decide we want to be a 25 or a 30 million dollar company. And 85 percent of those fail. And the reason they fail is explained really well in a book by a guy named Joel Arthur Barker. It's called Future Edge. And Joel talks about paradigm shifts. And he likens a paradigm to an S-curve, an upward S-curve. And at the very bottom, when that S-curve is just starting to go up, there are new folks called paradigm pioneers in his book. They're the ones who bring the new ideas. They look at what's there and go, you know what, I got a better way to do that. And then their way becomes the transcendent way to do it. And that's when the that S curve just goes straight up until it doesn't. And it starts to wane and it hooks down a little bit. And almost always the people who bring the next new ideas are paradigm pioneers. It's very, very difficult for somebody who's invested in a business and built it from ground from the ground up to allow themselves to take a different seat at the table and hand off those relationships you're talking about human behavior, and you can read Chip and Dan Heath and some of the other folks in modern literature about that. Human behavior is the hardest thing to change. And for a lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs, they can't picture themselves not staying in that role. So finding somebody to whom you can hand it is easy compared to being mature enough and emotionally stable enough to say, in order for my baby to grow, I have to let it go to college and leave the house. Yeah. Being able to let go of that and, and trust that someone knows what they're doing as well, too. Um, yeah, because if not, I mean, there goes that average two two year position. <laughs> well, it's it, 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 I mean, it's worse. You, you, you basically smother your business and then you start getting bitter and annoyed because you can't make that leap. And, you know, darn well, you've got a good product and you're well positioned in the marketplace but it, it's like Pogo said on that first Earth Day poster, we have met the enemy and they is us. So that, that's really the challenge for the business owner, in this case, your restaurant owner, to say, in order to grow, I've got to take a step back or sit at a different chair at the table. Or bring in a new chair. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I feel like I feel like where I'm, where I'm at, uh, you know, between you and me, uh, I feel like <laughs> where I'm at, you. right, yeah, between uh, you and me. I feel like I'm really good at the execution part. I can get it done, understand the process and the people and the team and the skills and the systems and all that stuff that it takes to be able to execute something. But when it comes on, when it comes to the uh, strategy side, I understand it. I get it. Uh, I probably couldn't build out, you know, uh, uh, the whole messaging and the storylines and, and the, the, the strategy part and the plans and, and all that kind of stuff. I bet you, I bet you if I spent the weekend working on a project like that, I bet you I could knock it out. I bet you I could. And I bet you I would do a decent job and you would be a great teacher <laughs> to judge it on uh, and grade it on. But that's like, again, you know, that's not always a, uh, a skill set that can be immediately acquired either. It's not like you can just bring in someone in that role to that seat at the table and then just be like, okay, here, study this and then go. Cause they may bring you something with no experience and also not having that talent on the other side of that, you know, the, the those brain waves to be able to bring that talent in to be able to build it. You know, there's, there's some, and also I feel like that role has to be somewhat visionary too. Um, they have to be able to foresee and then see from, you know, just like you said, like that 30,000 foot view all the way to that 5,000 foot view. That's, I guess that's kind of like my short recap as well, too, on some of the takeaways that I've got from this as well. Um, don't under, don't undermine the CMO, their position, their value. And, and we'll probably have to talk about some more of this stuff too, but making sure you try to vet them the best. Or I, however, however that should be done. I wouldn't it's know about to start it. with that. It's about relationship and culture. You know, back a zillion years ago, I had a client when I was first getting into the insurance business who sold really crummy furniture in a really crappy part of town. And one day I said to him, Jimmy, who buys this stuff? And he said, Davey, there's an ass for every seat. You've got to find the right person for the right fit for the right position. And it, it starts with chemistry. It's almost like dating. 
Oh, you know, that's so funny because I'm hiring right now. I've interviewed, I've been interviewing people for the last couple of weeks and I'm trying to hire for a content visit, content creator position. Um, uh, and I was telling, I was telling my team, I was like, I want to fangirl over somebody. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to, I want to see their resume, see, have a conversation with them and be like, this is it. It's the hit. It's the first date. This is happening. I love it. We're going to, we're going to keep them on now. <laughs> wait, wait, I want to, I want to make sure that I understand what you just said. You want to react emotionally to somebody who can help you solve a problem. That's what it sounds like. She whiz. Oh, shocker. What a concept. <laughs> who yeah. knew? And, and again, it comes back to the culture part. You know, when you just said that, uh, I was, um, I would rather have somebody with lacking skill sets, but they've got the passion and they fit right in the culture. I can, I can help you with the skill sets. I can work on that and I can have, provide you with tools, teams, and resources to, to fit that gap. But if you're bad for the culture, I don't care if you've got the greatest skill sets in the world, you got to go because you're going to kill the rest of us. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it, yeah. it's like a cancer. And that's, that's, you know, if you're, if you own a business, that's your primary role is to build the culture business to, to misquote Peter Drucker business is downstream from culture. Yeah. And that could be another reason why a company crashes and burns. Oh, culture. absolutely. Oh if man. I'm actually, careful. my fiance's company right now is like that. Their culture is pretty, um, it could be, well, no, no, it's not her. It's somebody else. They're pretty, the, there's man, who was it? There was someone I was talking to and they're like, oh man, my culture is terrible. Like the only reason why I'm here is for a paycheck outside of that. I'm out, you know, that's death. Yeah. That's death. That's a, that's a company that's got terminal cancer. And, and, and nothing will change until it makes a, a bottom line impact. And, and, and hopefully at that point it catches sea levels eyes and somebody up there goes, we have a problem. Is it sales? Well, okay. Well, something's wrong. Uh, it's not sales. It's working. It's not, is, is it HR? Okay. What's wrong with our people? Let's have some conversations with our, our managers and supervisors then hopefully they, they have those conversations and they go, okay, well, it's an HR problem. It's with people. It's the way that our culture is. And, and I hear a lot of people hate corporate culture. Well, there's, there's a, there's a reason for that, but you know, back geez, 20 something years ago, I was running a company. I was president of a company that had 300 employees and operations in a couple of different States. And when they hired me as president, they asked me what I wanted in my office. And I said, a mirror. So I don't care about the desk and all that other stuff, but it's got to have a mirror. And why, is that? Said, well, why, why does it have to have a mirror? And I said, because every time we make a mistake, every time we have to let somebody go, every time we lose a client, I want to stand in front of that mirror and say, how did I contribute to this problem or how did I help it? And C-level people don't often do that. And that's in, in your example of having them, you know, try to go, okay, well, something's wrong. It's the culture, but it's not us. Well, oh, almost yeah. always, what's that old Chinese expression of fish rots from the head down? It's almost always the people at the top of the pyramid. There's a great story in a, in a book by Mike Abershoff called Best Damn Ship in the Navy. And I, I won't belabor the whole story, but he's an admiral and he's asking all the sailors to come into his quarters, take off all the rank and whatnot, and just tell them what's wrong with the ship. And the last person who comes in says, sir, the way I see it, the Navy is like a big tree full of monkeys. When you look up. All you see is a bunch of monkeys smiling at you. When we look down, our view is a little bit different. And it, it's it's almost always the top. So get a mirror. If you're in a company and you don't like the culture and you're you're a, an owner or a, a gogomoga at that company, get a mirror. This comes back on you. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like that a lot of those roles have too much ego for them to be able to um, have the humility for to look at themselves and be like, is it something that I am doing? Well, of course not. That's not, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the president of the company. It couldn't be me. It's, right. it's somebody else. <laughs> and 90% of the time, it's you. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Uh, shit rolls downhill. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's a different discussion for another time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, David, it has been such a pleasure to spend the last hour um talking about all these stories and, and the positions for a CMO and marketing and messaging. Um, is, is there anything that really stood out to you in the last hour that we talked about that if we took away anything, what would that be? I, I, you know, I, I think if I had to boil it down to one thing, I think it's the comment you made about your client saying, you know, show me how this is going to work. Because I, I really do believe that what they're asking you is Braden, tell me a story. 
it, the whole world runs on stories. It always has. It always will. The medium in which you tell the story doesn't matter. How repetitive you are with telling the story may matter a little bit, but really doesn't matter. What matters is the story and understanding your role in it. If you can do that, there's nothing you can't conquer. If you can't do that, you're going to be swimming upstream for a long, long time. Very well said, man. We're going to, this is, this is great. Um, I really I appreciate you coming conversation. on. Man. Yeah, this has been awesome. Um, you guys, if you have any questions, how can, how can someone get a hold of you if they have questions or do you want um, They can go to my website, which is the Saltzman group, S A L T Z M A N.com. Um, they can go grab a downloadable that we've got specifically for folks when I appear on a podcast, which is the Saltzman group dot com forward slash download. Um, and there are buttons all over the place for how to get in touch and to set up a, a discovery call or just a conversation. I love chatting with people. I've never had a conversation where one of two things doesn't happen. I either win or I learn something. And hopefully you, you won and learned something today. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it was a pleasure chatting with you. I appreciate the invite. And in the show notes, you guys will be able to access those. I'll, I'll make sure that there's a link in there. So if you're wondering how do how do you get a hold of David or how do you contact or how do you learn more, um, that'll all be in the show notes. So I appreciate all you guys for listening. And David, thank you again. And we'll see you guys next time.